Hey guys, today's video lecture topic is bacteria. Please make sure you're filling in your notes organizer as you watch the video, making sure to answer every question. So the unit that we're in right now is viruses and bacteria. We've already covered viruses, so now we're moving on to bacteria, or more specifically, the prokaryotic kingdoms. So remember, there's only one type of prokaryotic organism, and that is bacteria. These are microscopic organisms. They're old. Um, they're some of the most numerous organisms. They're found in the deepest depths of the ocean, all the way to miles above the Earth's crust, so they are found everywhere. So since our unit contains viruses and bacteria, okay, make sure you know the major differences between the two. And the major differences is that viruses are considered non-living and bacteria are living. Why are they considered non-living or living? Because they either meet or don't meet the characteristics of all living things. So we reviewed viruses and we know that they do not meet all of the characteristics of living things, but bacteria do. So these are microscopic living organisms. Now, the word prokaryotic has a Greek origin. It means before a nucleus. Well, when, you, when we think about what we know about prokaryotic organisms, that makes sense, right? So we are talking about bacteria. We are talking about unicellular organisms that do not have a nucleus. They do not have membrane-bound organelles. So let's real quick compare prokaryotic and eukaryotic organisms and cells. Uh, fill in your Venn diagram on your notes organizer. So prokaryotic cells are much simpler, they are all unicellular, their cells contain genetic material just like eukaryotic cells, but they don't have a nucleus and they don't have those fancy membrane-bound organelles. They do have ribosomes, okay, because those are just little protein structures that produce protein. They do have cell walls, cell membranes, um, but they are very small, okay, about one micrometer. And then, of course, our organisms will be bacteria. Eukaryotic organisms, these cells are more complex. We have some unicellular organisms, we have some multicellular organisms. They contain genetic material just like prokaryotes, but they have a nucleus and they have those membrane-bound organelles. They also have ribosomes, some of them also have cell walls, they all have cell membranes, but these are larger and, and our example organisms would be protists, fungi, plants, and animals. So here's just a quick illustration of the you know, very simple prokaryotic cell compared to the much more complex and larger eukaryotic cell. This would be an example of an animal cell here. Okay, so we're going to get into prokaryotic kingdom classification. So just as a refresher, remember there are three domains, two prokaryotic domains, one eukaryotic domains, and there are six kingdoms. So our two bacteria kingdoms fall under our two bacteria domains. So fill in your chart here as you go along. So in the domain archaea, we have the kingdom archaebacteria. The major characteristics being that these are very ancient organisms. Um, and when you think about ancient Earth, you think about like a sort of extreme environment. So these organisms are able to live in extreme environments. They have cell walls that are not made of a substance called peptidoglycan. And I'll talk more about that in just a second. And their DNA is actually more similar to eukaryotic organisms, interestingly enough. Now, our examples of archaebacteria are thermoacidophiles, halophiles, and methanogens. So let's talk a second about those. These are types of archaebacteria that live in certain extreme environments. So thermoacidophiles, when you break that, down that word, thermo meaning hot, acido referring to acidic, they live in hot acidic environments like the hot springs of Yellowstone or the thermal vents at the bottom of the ocean. Halophiles... Halite is the salt mineral, so halophiles actually live in really salty environments like the Dead Sea. And then methanogens are methane-producing archaebacteria, arche so they actually are anaerobic, which means they cannot live in the pre presence of oxygen, so they live in places like the digestive tracts of animals. Okay, so all that like sort of goldish stuff around the ring of this hot spring, that is archaebacteria. Okay, there's some or some halophile archaebacteria. And then um, we have plenty of methanogens living in the digestive tracts of cows that helps them to digest all that grass that they eat. Now moving on to the domain bacteria, we have the kingdom eubacteria. When you think of bacteria, you think of the bacteria that belongs to kingdom eubacteria. So they have cell walls made of a substance called peptidoglycan, which allows them to have very strong cell walls. Some even have two layers of cell walls. And this is what ultimately determines the shape of the cell. And in bacteria, that's really important. And then our examples of eubacteria are the ones that you're familiar with, right? right? Like E. coli, or the bacteria that leads to strep throat, or the bacteria that leads to salmonella. These are all just, you know, your modern-day bacteria that belong to this kingdom. 
So let's quickly refresh the structure of a prokaryotic cell. So parts that you should label on your diagram, pili, ribosomes, chromosome or genetic material, the capsule, which is not to be confused with the capsid of a virus, the cell wall, the cell membrane, the flagella, and then uh, these are called plasmids, which are the circular forms of genetic material that only bacteria have. So two of the structures that I just mentioned are really unique, so let's take a second to go over them. Some bacteria have what's called a flagella, which is this thing right here, and it sort of acts like a tail-like whip and it rotates at the base and it sort of whips around which is which is going to allow them to move. Then some bacteria have these little hair-like projections called pili and these are going to be used for attachment and for reproduction and we'll talk more about that in just a second. Okay, so like I said, the capsule is not to be confused with the capsid. This is a carbohydrate covering um, that's used for protection, that's used for attachment. Then behind that, you have the cell wall and you bacteria. This is made of pe peptidoglycan and it provides structure to the cell. And then just like in all cells, you have a cell membrane, which is used to move materials in and out of the cell. And then inside the cell, you have the DNA, you have the cytoplasm, and then you have ribosomes. Um, that produce protein. So the genetic material is single-stranded and sometimes you have it in circular forms called plasmid and just like always it provides the genetic information. Okay, now I mentioned that shape is really important in bacteria, in prokaryotic organisms. Let's talk about why. Scientists classify bacteria based on three things. The cell wall that they have, okay, that's why they're archaebacteria or eubacteria, the way that they move, and then their shape. And we're going to focus on shape for just a second. There are three shapes of bacteria, round, rod, and spiral. And they, we have to give them, you know, fancy science names, right? So bacteria that have a spherical shape, we call that cocci, okay? When bacteria are rod-shaped, that is bacilli. And when bacteria are spiral-shaped, you will hear it as either spirochetes or spirilla. I will almost always use spirilla, but I do want to make sure that you've seen spirochetes. So you can see these bacteria here are circle shaped, these bacteria are more rod or oval shaped, and then these are more spiral shaped. Then some bacteria arrange in very specific ways, and those have prefixes as well. So if a bacteria arrangement has the prefix diplo, it means that it is paired, di, pair, to. So diplobacilli would be bacteria that are arranged in twos and they are rod shaped, so pairs of rod shaped bacteria. Strepto, that means chain, so a chain of prokaryotic cells, bacteria. So, for example, strep throat, that is streptococcus, which is a chain of spherical bacteria. A tetrad is a group of four bacteria in a single plane. So, for example, if I said bacilla tetrad bacteria, that means four, right, because tetrad, bacilla rod-shaped bacteria. And then staphylo means a cluster of cells, so a random cluster. So you've heard of a staph infection, that's staphylococcus. So a staphylococcus bacteria is spherical clusters. So I think in your picture here for number 10, it says draw and label. So this one, you've got pairs of rods sort of joined together. So that would be diplobacilli, so you could draw that. This one is an arrangement of four spherical bacteria, so a tetrad of cocci bacteria. This is staphylococcus, which is clusters of circles. Like if you zoomed in on that, you would see little circles that are all clustered together. Here is a spirochete or a spirilla bacteria. And then here, this is streptococcus right here, this, the bacteria that would cause strep throat. So a chain of spherical bacteria. So pick one or two of those to draw and label. Okay, now bacteria obtain nutrition in two ways. They can be heterotrophic or they can be autotrophic. So remember, heterotrophic bacteria have to consume other organisms to get their nutrition. So heterotrophic bacteria are either parasites or they are decomposers or saprobes is another word for that. Autotrophic bacteria we know make their own food and they can do that in one of two ways. You have photoautotrophic bacteria or chemoautotrophic bacteria. Photoautotrophs are what we usually talk about, right? Photosynthesizers. They use light to make their own food. They provide us with oxygen. An example of a bacteria that does this would be called cyanobacteria, this like bluish green bacteria. Chemoautotrophs are bacteria that instead of using light, use chemicals or chemical compounds to, to produce their own food. 
So the bacteria that are living in the thermal vents of the oceans, they'll use like the sulfur from the thermal vents in order to make their own food, but they're still producers, they're still autotrophic. Okay, now the way that bacteria metabolize can happen in different ways, depending on whether or not there is oxygen available. So bacteria that are called obligate aerobes mean that they have to have the presence of oxygen to live. Bacteria that are obligate anaerobes, they are anaerobic, which means that they will die in the presence of oxygen. And bacteria that are facultative anaerobes sort of fall in the middle. They don't require oxygen, but they're not going to die if it is present. So the, these little test tubes will show you sort of how that works, right? So we've got oxygen up here, very little oxygen down here. So obligate aerobes, bacteria that require oxygen, you'll find up here. Obligate anaerobes, you'll find down here where the oxygen is very low. But facultative anaerobes, which don't die in the presence of oxygen but don't need it, are going to be found all throughout our test tube. Now bacteria can reproduce in two ways, asexually or sexually. When a bacteria reproduces asexually, it's called binary fission. This is essentially mitosis. It's the same thing. It produces genetically identical cells and happens very quickly. So bacteria, you can go from, you know, one to one billion in just a matter of hours. So basically, the cell just splits, just like mitosis. Conjugation is a little more complicated because it is a form of sexual reproduction. The two prokaryotes, the two bacteria attach, they join their pili together, and then that pili, remember those hair-like projections, essentially act as like a little bridge for the genetic information to travel through. And so you have this exchange of genetic information which creates genetic diversity. And when you're talking about bacteria, that can be a really good thing, right? A strong species is one that is genetically varied because more of them can survive. Speaking of survival, we have some different ways that bacteria utilize different adaptations for survival. So one of those is called an endospore. Some bacteria produce this little dormant cell that covers and protects the genetic material and almost acts as like a little seed protection covering um, that allows them to survive when they're in really like extreme environments or um, environments that are, are very uh, varied. So anthrax, botulism, tetanus are all examples of bacteria that utilize endospores. And then many bacteria are able to reproduce quickly and mutate quickly, which leads to genetic changes, which ensures the survival of at least a few of the organisms, right, which is always the goal. But the problem is that this is what leads to antibiotic resistance, and we'll talk more about that in class. So bacteria, we typically think of them as being harmful, but in reality, there are very helpful bacteria. The normal flora, when you hear that, that is the harmless bacteria that are living in your body, and many of them are actually aiding um, in, in various things. So for example, E. coli in your intestines is actually aiding with your digestion, and these bacteria can produce the vitamins that you need, so not all bacteria are harmful. Some ex another example of helpful bacteria that we've discussed in class are those nitrogen-fixing bacteria that can be found in the roots of plants. The decomposer bacteria that recycle nutrients. The bacteria that's used to make certain foods like milk and cheese. Of course, those autotrophic bacteria pro provide us with oxygen. And then many medicines actually use bacteria to be able to treat certain infections. And then a pathogen, just to review that vocab term, is anything that causes a disease. So some pathogenic bacteria, a lot of these you're very familiar with. Pick a couple to write down on your list there. And if you are, if you have a bacterial infection, your, daughter, your doctor is going to prescribe you with an antibiotic, which is to treat a bacterial infection by blocking the growth and reproduction of bacteria. Some common antibiotics that you've probably been given at some point in your life, penicillin, amoxicillin, azithromycin, which is a Z-pack if you've ever heard of that, doxycycline, and then when you take these, your doctor is going to tell you, eat yogurt while you're taking these antibiotics because they kill bacteria good and bad. Yogurt is full of probiotics, which are good bacteria, so they're going to replace the bacteria that's good that the antibiotics have killed in your body. Um, bacteria grow best in certain conditions, warm temperatures, a neutral pH, ox in the presence of oxygen, in the presence of moisture, and then of course some source of food. So knowing that, keep that in mind when we grow bacteria around our school. In order to control bacteria, there are certain things that you can do, right? You should be familiar with this. You refrigerate your food, you heat your food, you wash your hands, you use disinfectants, and you use sanitizers. 
So that's a quick review of bacteria. If you would like an extra credit opportunity, here is something that you can do. Write a three to five sentence paragraph about one of these things. Hope you're having a great day. Bye.